Hello and welcome to this lecture on power. Power is the ability to change someone else's behavior. Influence is the actual act of changing that someone else's behavior. Power emanates from a variety of sources, takes a variety of forms, and is sometimes but not always used. Additionally, there are a variety of influence tactics that people use. Some influence tactics are more effective than others depending upon the nature of the desired behavior, the person being influenced, and the person doing the influence. That sounds like a lot of variables, but we'll sort them all out in this lecture. Before we do though, think about the last time someone tried to get you to do something. It might have been something with which you agreed or it might not. Try and frame the content of this lecture into your own experience as a member of an organization who was trying to be influenced, more specifically, upon whom power was being asserted. Let's get started. First, we'll start with the model, the diagrams, all of the major components of the expression and use of power in an organization. So we'll start with sources of power, and we have a separate slide on this, and you'll become very familiar with all of the various sources. And then we have to recognize that having power and using power are often two different things. So the capacity of a person, a team, or an organization to influence other is a source of power. Using that power is up to the discretion of the person, the organization, or the team, however it may be. And then there are, of course, consequences that we envision or foresee or experience related to the expression or use of power. And of course, there are always contingencies. These contingencies can help uh, uh, double this, the impact of a source of power in our ability to use power over others. So it's kind of a magnification process there. So let's move on. First, we'll explore the various sources of power. And the first one to think about is expert power. And this is an individual's or a work unit's capacity to influence others by possessing knowledge or skills that is valued. So employees gain expert power over companies in a knowledge economy. We hire employees for what they know. We hire knowledge workers for what they know and what they can do. People who have expertise in a certain thing have a particular amount of power. The second source there would be referent power. And this occurs when others identify with, like, or otherwise respect the person. This is often associated with charismatic leadership. Marketing companies make great use of referent power. Years ago, there was a Gatorade commercial starring Michael, ja uh, Jackson, <laughs> Michael Jordan, and the tagline was, be like Mike. Well, the implication was, if you drink Gatorade, you'll be like Mike. And everyone wants to be like Mike. He has particular high levels of charisma and he has influence. And so let's be like Mike. And that was capitalizing on his referent power. Next, we have reward power. This is the ability to control the allocation of rewards that are valued by others and even to remove negative sanctions. Now, reward power operates both upward and downward. That is, supervisors can provide rewards to subordinates, but subordinates can also provide rewards to supervisors. So it's a two-way sort of a street there. The opposite side of that two-sided coin is coercive power. This is the ability to apply punishment. This also can be exhibited upward as well as downward. And if you think about coercive power, think about something that many of us experience daily, peer pressure. This is a form of coercive power. So when our peers influence us to do something that we otherwise may not have done, they're coercing us to do something. They have coercive power. And the last on this list would be called legitimate power. And this is the agreement that people in certain roles can request certain behaviors of others. Essentially, we give 
legitimate power dependent upon your position in the organizational hierarchy. So business owners, of course, have legitimate power over all employees. They can hire and fire at their own discretion without checking with anyone. The CEO has tremendous legitimate power over everyone else in the organizational hierarchy, except perhaps the owners. The owners can't be fired. So legitimate power and coercive power and referent uh, reward power all emanate from a particular source and expert and referent power emanate from a different source that is personal power. So expert power and referent power go with the person from role to role and from job to job and from organization to organization. You take your expertise with you. You take your referent power, your likability, your charisma with you. It goes with you. It emanates from within you. So it's a broadly construed personal source of power. And the other three come from the position that you hold. So depending on your position in the organizational hierarchy, you have more or less reward, coercive, and legitimate power. If the CEO is fired from the company, they lose all reward, coercive, and legitimate power. They no longer can give rewards, they no longer can coerce anyone to do something, and they no longer have legitimate power over anyone else. So that power emanates from the position. So let's move on. Now we're going to blow up the contingency box there and look at some things that people can use to capitalize upon their sources of power. That is, how can they magnify um, their sources of power if they have a little bit or if they have a lot and they just want some more? So some of these things that expand upon or affect the nature of the relationship between a source of power and the use of power over others are contingencies known as centrality. Centrality is the degree and the nature of interdependence between the power holder and others. So think for a second about a company that is, let's say, for example, a patent company, an intellectual property company, and all they do is hold patents and they license those patents to companies to use the patent te patented technology to manufacture certain project products. So in that case, the chief legal officer, the chief contract interpreter, so to speak, has a very central position. So if a salesperson wants to license the technology that the company has a patent on to another company, then they first have to get approval from the chief of legal operations. So that's a very central person. So they may have reward, legitimate, coercive, and hopefully that person has some expert power, but they have even more because now they're very central to the operation. Another contingency which can help us expand upon our sources of power is discretion. This is the freedom to exercise judgment without referring to a rule or receiving permission from anyone else. So if we're allowed to make decisions on the fly, decisions that will presumably benefit the company, then we have discretion. Now, new employees, entry-level employees, lower-level employees tend not to be given very much discretion. For example, if you walk up to the counter at Burger King and you say, I would like one of your world-famous Whoppers, but... I want filet mignon on this Whopper. I don't want ground beef. We don't allow the counterperson at Burger King to make that decision themselves. They do not have the discretion to substitute steak for hamburger on Burger King's sandwiches. Now, someone up the food chain would have the food chain. There's a pun for Burger King. Well, up the food chain would have more discretion in making decisions upon their own and on behalf of the company. Next, we have the concept of substitutability. And this is when there's a, an availability of alternatives. So power is strongest when someone has a monopoly over a valued resource. So there are some methods of increasing power through substitutability. They include things like controlling the tasks. So for example, government has laws that give certain professions exclusive right to perform certain tasks. 
You must have a license and proper educational credentials to practice medicine, to conduct surgery. You must have a license and proper credentials to work as an attorney in the court system. There are all sorts of credentialing agencies which give us or give certain people a certain non-substitutable source of power. So let's hope that our physician has expertise in, in medical uh, stuff, but they also have a license to practice medical uh, procedures. So now they have uh, expanded or doubled their source of power. We also have uh, controlling knowledge as a substitutability contingency. Uh, when workers hoard knowledge by say, destroying uh, man repair manuals for machines, that would be making themselves non-substitutable. So for example, let's say there's a nice repair manual that goes with the machine. Um, and there are two people who regularly operate the machine, only one of whom knows how to repair the machine when it breaks without consulting the manual. And then the machine breaks. And so that person, in order to expand upon his expertise power, his expert power and other sources of power, he destroys the manual. The manual suddenly goes missing. So that person now has control over the knowledge that the company desperately needs to repair the machine. They are the only one who can do it. We also have substitutability issues when we think of controlling labor. So labor unions try and limit labor supply by forcing everyone to join a union or uh, forcing a company to engage in collective bargaining with the union, they have expanded upon their power by making them non-substitutable. Okay, next we have another contingency, visibility. Visibility is the degree to which one's efforts are known and recognized by others. So let's say, for example, an employee uh, puts all of their diplomas and such on their office wall and uh, and lower level employee comes in, sees the wall, sees the diplomas and says, oh my, this person really knows what they're talking about. His or her credentials are highly visible to me. I can see the person has multiple degrees and certificates, etc. So let's take a look at this picture in action. Here we have the office walls of a professor who has on the left hand side diplomas and certificates and all sorts of different journals to which he or she subscribes. And on the right hand side, we see all sorts of framed publications. And so if a student or a business professional walked into the office, they might look at those walls and say, holy cow. This person knows exactly what they're talking about. They really must be an expert because their credentials are so visible to us. Okay, let's move on. Okay, next we're going to blow up the blue box on the right there, which is the power or influence over others. And that's actually how do we use the power that we may or may not have? How do we use the sources of power when multiplied by the contingencies that we've expressed? How do we use that to exert influence over others? And there's a giant list here and we're going to go over them all. First, we have something called silent authority. And this is simply following the request of someone who has reward or coercive or expert power without them overtly influencing us. So this is based upon legitimate power um, on role modeling. Uh, and this is common in a high power distance culture. For example, let's say there's a, a manufacturing plant that has a big uh, executive office with a window looking out over the plant. And the employees can occasionally look up there and see that the boss is toiling away at her desk. But when she walks out of that office and walks around the plant floor, the manufacturing plant floor, everyone improves their performance just a little bit. Why? Because this is the boss. You do not want to be seen as a lazy slacker and unproductive employee when the boss is standing right next to you. Does the boss do or say anything? No. They've just exerted their silent authority, and we know that we don't want to mess up in their presence. Next, we have assertiveness. 
This is actively applying legitimate and coercive power, sometimes called vocal authority. So this involves reminding, confronting, checking, or even threatening people. So a way of assert, being assertive is to walk up to a subordinate and say, you know, you've been messing up a lot lately. Lately, If you mess up anymore, you will be fired. That's being very assertive. That's using your legitimate and your coercive power to get a very strong message across to the subordinate. Next, we have information control. And this is manipulating others' access to information. And this may sound kind of like the substitutability contingency, but it's slightly different. Uh, here, we're withholding, we're filtering, or we're rearranging information. Think, for example, about a, a, a top secret project that only a few people are aware of. Um, since everyone wants to remain a part of the top secret team, and information has been given to each of them on a need-to-know only basis, these people will tend not to share their information with each other. If they give what information they have to the other person of the top secret team, they lose all value to the team. How and why would they continue to be a member of the team when the other person now knows what they know? Okay, next we have coalition formation. This is the expression of power or influence by forming a group to gain more power over individuals than one could alone. And so it involves pooling your resources and your power. And it legitimizes the issue and it helps gain power through an expression of social identity. So, for example, let's say you have a boss who's particularly rude and condescending to the employees and makes them engage in all sorts of uh, shenanigans in the workplace just for their kicks and, gr uh, kicks and grins. And so the employees get fed up with it. Now, if one person walks up to the boss and says, I don't like you treating us that way, the boss can say, fine, you're fired. But if every employee gets together and forms a coalition and they all go to the boss and they say, if you don't stop treating us that, this way, we will all quit. Now the, bo the boss has no choice. The boss has been influenced and the subordinates by pooling their resources and their power have a much stronger front and the boss must do what they say. Next we have upward appeal. With this, this is appealing to a higher authority. And this includes appealing sometimes to the firm's goals. So, for example, children use this sort of a thing all the time. How many times have you heard a child say to their sibling, um, if you don't stop, I'm telling mom. That's an upward appeal. One child has no power over the other. They're just children. But by threatening to go to a higher authority, they've expressed an, uh, a source of power and they've influenced their sibling by using this upward appeal. Next, we have persuasion. This is using logics, facts, and emotional appeals to gain acceptance of an idea. This is perhaps the best way to influence other people. It's also probably the most difficult. Some people simply don't have the skills, the communicative skills, the intelligence that it takes to be an effective persuader. But if you do, you can eschew all other forms of influence and expression of power in favor of this because this is the best way to influence others. Next we have ingratiation. Ingratiation is increasing the liking or the similarity to a particular target by flattering, helping, and seeking advice. The classic example of this is from the 1950s television show, Leave it to Beaver, where there was a character named Eddie Haskell. And Eddie was friends with Lumpy and the Beaver, the two uh, boys in the family. And he was Lumpy's best friend, but he was not a good boy. He was not a nice boy. He got Lumpy and the Beaver into all sorts of trouble. But whenever Mrs. Cleaver walked in the room, his tune changed immediately. And he would look at her and smile ever so sweetly and say, 
my, Mrs. Cleaver, what a lovely dress you have on. And she would say, oh, thank you. Thank you so much. He was ingratiating her. He was brown nosing her. So he influenced her to think that he was not such a bad kid when in reality, he really, really was. As a side note, interestingly, the actor who portrayed him went on to be a detective in the Los Angeles Police Department for a number of decades and did some really good things. And he was a good guy. He was just a good actor as well. Okay, next we have impression management. This is actively shaping our public image by the way we dress or even sometimes by padding our resume. So impression management is influencing others. It's an overt influence of others by manipulating how we're perceived by them. So when we go for a job interview, we press our shirt, we comb our hair, we shine our shoes, we're on our best behavior. Do we do all of those things every single day of our lives? Probably not. But we're trying to influence others to make a decision about hiring us. So we're pre presenting ourselves in the best way possible. Now, padding a resume can have a very negative impact. Uh, in the 24-7 uh, YouTube, Facebook, instant background check world we live in today, padding a resume is never a good idea. You will be found out and you will not be hired. And if you are hired, you will be fired. Next, we have exchange. And in the exchange method of influencing other, we promise or remind them of past benefits in exchange for compliance with our request. So negotiation is very integral to this step strategy. And networking, of course, relates to the exchange influence. So, for example, we go up to someone and say, you know, do you remember two weeks ago when I worked late on a Friday for you so you could pick your child up um, after school and uh, take your child to an early soccer match. I need you to work late for me today. That's an exchange. That's tit for tat. That's quid pro quo. And so essentially we're saying, do this for me because I did this, something like this for you previously. So all of these are various ways of influencing others. So we've moved from having power, referent, expert, etc., and magnifying those sources of power via the expression of different contingencies like visibility, discretion, and centrality. Now we've moved over to the actual use of power. The question now is, what happens when you use power? Well, let's move these three boxes to the left a little bit. We're going to add a fourth box and move on. Here's that fourth box in yellow here. These are the consequences of power or the use of influence. What happens when we try and influence other people? Well, one of the things is we can encounter resistance. Another is that we can encounter compliance. And the third one is we can encounter commitment. So let's think about these. Resistance is, well, all right. I don't really want to do this for you. I don't really want to work late for you on a Friday. You said that you would never, uh, you know, call me out on this favor that I asked you for, but whatever. That's resistance. Compliance is, uh, okay, I'll do it. Commitment is, heck yeah, I'll do it. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to show you how much I appreciate you staying late for me. So which of these influence tactics is more likely to lead to resistance or compliance or commitment? Let's find out as we move on. So here we have five influence tactics on the left, silent authority, upward appeal, coalition formation, information control, and assertiveness. They tend to lead to either resistance or compliance. Most of the time, they will result in resistance. Sometimes they'll result in compliance. This other group on the far right here, persuasion, 
ingratiation, impression management, and exchange, they tend to more often result in commitment. They sometimes also result in compliance. So this compliance consequence in the middle is an area of overlap. All influence tactics can result in compliance, but very rarely do persuasion, ingratiation, impression management, and exchange result in resistance. And almost never do silent authority, upward appeal, coalition formation, information control, and assertiveness, very rarely do they ever result in commitment. So we can think of these as both hard tactics and soft tactics. And so the hard tactics result in resistance or compliance. Soft tactics result in compliance or commitment. You can think of soft tactics as being more friendly and less coercive. So if we're using a hard tactic, we will rarely get the person that we're trying to be uh, influenced. We will rarely get them to completely and wholeheartedly endorse our point of view. They will almost never be committed to it. On the other side, when we're using persuasion, we will rarely encounter resistance. If we're any good at it, we will rarely encounter resistance if we engage in ingratiation or impression management or exchange. So those are soft tactics. So let's move on to something a little bit different. Organizational politics. These are behaviors that others perceive as self-serving and these are tactics that people use for personal gain at the expense of other people and sometimes even at the expense of the organization. So this is the expression of self-serving behaviors. And we see this sort of thing in every organization. Politics is present in every organization to one degree or another. Well, the conditions which give rise to low, medium, or high levels of organizational politics include the following. First, when we have complex and ambiguous decisions. If there's no if this, then that rule book, if we're making non-programmed decisions, then self-serving behavior tends to rear its head more often. If we have scarce resources in the company, let's say there are a limited amount of funds for new project development, and we have lots of new projects that various groups are trying to push forward, only some of them will be funded. How is it that the company will decide which project gets funded? Some of it, some of the decisions will be based upon the self-serving behavior of the people backing one project or another. Next, we have when there is organizational change underway. As a company is expressing a lot of organizational change, say because of a merger or an acquisition by another company, then self-serving behavior tends to rear its head quite readily. And lastly, we have when companies have an expression of or tolerance for politics. In some companies, they simply say, that's fine, that's the way we do things. We engage in a little backstabbing. We engage in a little palm greasing, so to speak. We engage in a little bit of self-serving behavior here because we believe that ultimately people who are good at those things tend to be good in their dealing with external constituencies on behalf of the company. So if we foster a little bit of internal politics, then we can also use that political skill to engage in exchange relationships with other companies and members of other constituencies. Now, two people working for the same company may witness the same things and perceive that there are different levels of politics. So perceptions of organizational politics is in the eye of the beholder. Some people are really sensitive to these things. Others don't even recognize that they're going on. Well, that's all. Thanks for listening. I hope you learned something and we look forward to next time.